Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. This one is all about the European Union, an institution that my country made the brave decision to leave. <laughs> Not really. That was probably a mistake. Let's get into it. But before we do, this video is brought to you by News Voice. The news is broken. Almost all US media is owned by just a handful of big corporations. Fake news, huge problem as well, and finding something unbiased can be hard. News Voice is revolutionizing the news landscape. It is an app that gives you a personalized news feed by aggregating major news sites as well as international independent media, giving some much needed balance. Each news story shows multiple sources which are all tagged with their bias and perspective. The news affects almost everything in our lives, what we hear and read, shapes which people we trust, what we eat, what we buy, how we vote even how we think. And look, you just clicked on a video all about the European Union, so you're pretty smart. You're gonna like News Voice. News Voice is created by its readers as you can upvote stories that you find interesting so more people will see them. It's essentially a democratized platform for news. Plus, it saves you time. You get all of the news and all of the sources in one app so that you can be better informed. And it's totally free. What? Get started with News Voice today for free through the link below. It's available on both Google Play and the App Store. And let's get into it. Out of the ashes of World War II, a new Europe emerged, divided roughly between East and West, capitalism and communism. This new Europe, it lasted just shy of 50 years before the fall of the Berlin Wall set in motion a dizzying series of events. With the Soviet Union collapsing, yet another Europe was about to appear. On the 1st of November 1993, a new united continent began to take shape. The age of the European Union had begun. Much has been said about the European Union since those heady days of the early 1990s, Britain's seemingly never-ending departure, known by a word that I think every single British person is absolutely sick of, Brexit has shone a light more than ever on the grand union of countries. The European Union has been divisive from the outset, and if anything, age has only exacerbated these problems. It is a complex structure that governs laws, freedom of movement, borders, trade, and much more. It is a topic that has a habit of rousing raw emotion in many, but it remains a stand-alone project. Visionary or disastrous, let's take a look, shall we? Nowhere on earth has such bloodshed been seen than in Europe. The first half of the 20th century saw wars on a previously unimaginable scale tear Europe apart. Except for a few countries who remained neutral during the world wars, the impacts on almost every nation was horrific. Just in case you're wondering about the neutral European countries, Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, and Monaco remained out of World War I, while Andorra, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and the Vatican were neutral during World War II. I suppose it is kind of hard to imagine the Pope whipping out a machine gun. But before all of the 20th century, can you imagine that picture of Winston Churchill, you know, with the gun? <laughs> This is a picture of the Pope with the same thing. But before all of the 20th century carnage, there had been a growing movement of European solidarity. Victor Hugo, who wrote Le Miserable, even went so far as to use the phrase the United States of Europe at the International Peace Congress held in Paris in 1849. Obviously, these ideals fell on deaf ears as the continent eventually collapsed into the largest war the world had ever known, with estimates of total deaths thought to be in the region of 17 million. Efforts to form some sort of consolatory system backfired in catastrophic circumstances as, 21 years after the end of the Great War, a new epic struggle began which would totally eclipse it. The second great conflict of the 20th century led to between 70 and 85 million people around the world losing their lives around 3 percent of the total global population. In terms of tragedy, nothing comes even close. We've recently done a video on mega projects all about the Marshall Plan, a US-led reconstruction plan to aid the shell-shocked and obliterated Europe. Now, if you want more on the Marshall Plan, then absolutely do go head on over to that video. We're going to kind of skip over it, a, a lot of it here, because, you know, we've only got limited time and we do want to deal with the EU. But in short, the Marshall Plan helped kickstart Europe's rejuvenation. Well, I mean, the Western countries, at least. Those nations that formed the Eastern Bloc, principally anything east of the Berlin Wall, also received 
received assistance of sorts from the Soviet Union, but it was hardly comparable. Now, it's important to remember the Europe had been pulled apart by extreme nationalism. Countries were eager not to make the same mistakes as had been made at the Treaty of Versailles, in which Germany was punished harshly for its role in the First World War, and which most people agree led in part to World War II. Almost as soon as the guns fell silent, there was talk of a united Europe. One of the early supporters was none other than British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who gave a speech at the University of Zurich on the 19th of September 1946, in which the term United States of Europe was used again. At the Hague Congress in 1948, two fundamental structures were put in place which began the road to European unity. These were the European Movement International, the Lobbying Association campaigning for better coordination in Europe, and the College of Europe, based primarily in Bruges in Belgium, which was designed to educate and provide accommodation for Europe's future leaders. These were small steps, but in 1949, the first major step was taken with the establishment of the Council of Europe. The ten founding members included Belgium, Denmark, France, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. The focus of the Council was on human rights and democracy, and it didn't really include anything on trade or economics. The Council of Europe still exists today and currently has 47 member states and is often seen as a stepping stone to European Union membership. While its aims were undoubtedly admirable, some countries wanted things taken even further when it came to trade issues. In 1952, the European Coal and Steel Community was formed, consisting of Belgium, France, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and West Germany to regulate their industrial production, but also placing it under a centralized authority. This was the first real shot of what would go on to become the EU's trade and free market agreements. If you're wondering why coal and steel, well, it was for two key reasons. Firstly, both were enormous industries that would play a key role in future developments and hence could make a considerable profit. Secondly, and much more honorably, coal and steel were both seen as vital for waging war. Advocates for the European coal and steel community believed that by tying each nation's coal and steel industry together, it might help to prevent another outbreak of war. Now, this sounds a little sentimental and perhaps unrealistic to our pessimistic modern brains, but such was the devastation in 1945 that you can only admire this attempt to ensure long-term peace. And look, if you're starting to get confused, we've mentioned a lot of organizations already. Well, bad news, we've only just begun. There were numerous organizations, treaties, and collaborations which often worked in parallel to one another. This was not so much a linear system of improvements until the establishment of the EU in 1993, but rather a slightly scattergun approach as the continent tried numerous different methods, but generally they were all working towards just a more united Europe. In 1957, the Treaty of Rome led to the formation of the European Economic Community, or EEC, which included Belgium, France, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and West Germany. The EEC led to the establishment of a customs union, which means no customs duties are paid on goods moving around the Union, and also spawns the European Atomic Energy Community, Euratom, to develop nuclear energy. So if you're still following along, we have the European Coal and Steel Community, the European Economic Community, and the European Atomic Energy Community all up and running, and all pretty much working to build a stronger continent. It wasn't until 1965 that somebody had the bright idea of merging these three organizations into one now known as the European Communities. Over the next two decades, numerous nations joined the European Communities. Greenland even joined and then left over disagreements about fishing regulations, while the Norwegian government agreed to join but was voted down by a referendum in the country. The last major change before the establishment of the EU came in 1985 with the Schengen Agreement, which would eventually abolish border checks throughout member countries, although it wouldn't be fully implemented for another 10 years. The fall of the Berlin Wall in November 1991 was a momentous event that was felt the world over. As the USSR began to crumble and individual nations broke free, it began to look like a united Europe might finally be on the cards. German Chancellor Helmut Kohl and French President Francois Mitterrand were considered two of the key players in the signing of the Maastricht Treaty on the 7th of February 1992, though it came into effect the following year, which formed the EU, originally with just Germany, France, Italy, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. These were heady days, with the first elections held in 1994 and the Schengen Agreement fully implemented in 1995. Excitement was in the air at New Europe was taking shape. 
The EU has slowly expanded, and in 1995, Austria, Finland, and Sweden joined. In 2004, the largest single intake saw Cyprus, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, Poland, Slovakia, and Slovenia join the Union. In 2007, Bulgaria and Romania joined the EU, with Croatia becoming the 28th member in 2013. The political and decision-making system that the EU uses is a complex one, and one that has led to numerous disagreements over the years. EU laws can roughly be divided into two. Firstly, we have the laws that are implemented without the need for each country to ratify them, known as regulations. The second, known as directives, specifically require national implementation measures. These are often seen as goals that the EU countries agree to, but how each country gets there can be different. One example of an EU regulation is the common safeguard of goods imported into the EU. This regulation is the same wherever you are in Europe and individual countries have no say in it. An example of an EU directive was the Consumer Rights Directive, which was designed to strengthen the rights of the consumer across Europe by removing hidden charges and costs. The EU set out a goal and it was up to each country to work towards it in their own way. It may sound like a single entity, but the European Union is actually made up of seven decision-making bodies, because we don't have enough bodies already. The European Council this is focused on the political directions and priorities of the EU. Heads of government meet at summits, typically held every quarter, to discuss all things EU-related and come to some sort of consensus on the direction they want things to go. This sounds a little simplistic, and I'm certain that it's never this easy. Next up, the European Commission. Once a consensus has been reached by the European Council, the European Commission turns it into a legislative proposal. In fact, this is the only institution within the EU that can propose legislation. Next up, the Council of the European Union. This council brings together ministers from member states within a specific government department. Transportation, sport, or education, for example. Approval is needed by this council before any proposal can enter law. Next, the European Parliament. The Parliament includes 705 elected representatives from the EU members. Like like the Council of the EU, it has the power to amend, approve, or reject Commission proposals. Next, the Court of Justice of the European Union. The role of the Court of Justice is to ensure the uniform application of EU law and to resolve any disputes that arise between the members. Next up, the European Central Bank. Unsurprisingly, the European Central Bank is directly responsible for financial stability within the EU. Finally, the European Court of Auditors. This rather dour-sounding department investigates improper financial management both within countries themselves and stemming from the use of EU funds. Now, before we go on to the European Union budget and where it all goes, there is the small matter of the euro. On the 1st of January 1999, the euro was adopted by 11 countries. Since then, another eight members have chosen the euro as their national currency. The idea was to maximize efficiency, promote growth, stability, and economic integration in Europe. The other side of that coin, Pardon the pun, is that it has sometimes created a rigid monetary policy which has not allowed individual countries who may be experiencing specific problems not seen in other members to control their own inflation and interest rates. This became evident after the 2008 recession when several countries required an EU bailout after their economies went into a tailspin. The restrictions placed on Greece after their second bailout were seen by many as draconian and led many to wonder whether the EU as a whole would be able to continue in the same way. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that finance is often a bit of a sticky subject within the EU. Every seven years, a budget is agreed by the member states. This is a decision that has to be met unanimously by the leaders of each nation, so you can imagine that this often takes some time. Each country pays into a pot every year. Some of that goes on administration, but much of it goes on projects throughout the EU, and also some outside of it. But not every country pays the same, and not everybody receives the same. Let's start with contributions. If we look at 2018, Germany, as the the largest economy contributed 20.78% of the budget. France was second with 15.58% and the UK was third with 11.88%. Each nation pays the same 2% of its national income, hence richer countries pay more 
than poorer countries. On the other side, you have countries that are receiving more money than they are putting in. In 2018, Poland's difference was 11.5 billion euros, with Hungary on 5 billion euros and Greece on 3.2 billion euros. Now, to some, that will sound like the most absurd deal you can imagine, but the budget doesn't tell the whole story. While poorer countries receive more money from the EU, richer countries and their strong national economies benefit significantly more by being in the single European market. To emphasize this point, while Germany puts in vastly more than it takes out, a study found that single market participation has raised the average German yearly income by a thousand euros. If we take a look at the 2014 EU budget, which came to 135.5 billion euros, almost 40% of it was spent on agriculture and fisheries. Much of this goes to subsidies for farmers, sometimes as much as half of their total income. That might sound ridiculous, but the truth is that much of modern farming is just not profitable, and the EU, and indeed many countries around the world, choose to support their farmers through additional payments. The development of poorer areas is the second largest sector in 2014. 54 billion euros, 39% of the total was spent on it. 31 billion euros was spent on regional developments, which often included roads, railways, education, and health programs. 13 billion euros was distributed to the 15 poorest members of the EU, and the remaining 8 billion euros was distributed among all of the members. Research, education, and innovation received the third largest slice of the pie, with 12 billion euros. The overall aim is to boost the EU's competitiveness, economic growth, and job creation. Now, nobody ever likes talking about administration fees. It's pretty boring, but it's only fair to include it here. The 2014 budget set aside 8 billion euros for administration. That may sound like an extraordinarily high number, but with 55,000 employees and seven EU bodies, you can see how the money gets spent pretty quickly. In 2016, the British people voted in a referendum on the nation's involvement with the EU. 52% of voters chose to leave, which began the long, drawn-out and still not complete, as of recording, divorce between Britain and the EU. Ask any British person about this particular time in the country, and they are likely to look at you with a sense of weary shell shock. It was not a pleasant time, as the great debate over whether Britain should take a leading role in a stronger Europe or cut ties and go it alone became rather nasty. The results of the referendum set off alarm bells around Europe, with some assuming other countries might choose to try and do the same. Fortunately, that hasn't happened. If anything, the stronger economies – Germany, France, Italy, Holland, and Spain – all seem to have doubled down on their commitment to the project, and an ideal that began after the hellish bloodshed of World War II. The world in general has been caught up in a wave of nationalism in recent years, the kinds which the EU was formed to prevent. The Union is far from being a perfect organization, but when you look at what it has built in just 75 years, it is quite extraordinary. While Britain is seemingly zigzagging without a clear direction for now, the EU, relatively speaking, remains quite strong. As China continues to grow in power and Europe becomes sandwiched between two superpowers, it makes sense to stick together and build a stronger Union. There will always be arguments over fishing rights, budgets, and bureaucracy. But it's important to remember what the European Union stands for. The EU motto is unity in diversity. And there is probably nowhere on the planet with such diversity so close together in a land where the most brutal acts of war ever committed took place. A bond of cooperation and friendship has emerged. Out of the ashes of destruction, a better Europe has risen. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe for more mega projects. Let me know in the comments if you've got suggestions. Also, please do check out and support this show by checking out our fantastic sponsor, Ground News. Link below. Thank you for watching.